Did you want to learn COBOL today? Yes, you did. Hi, so I made a video game in COBOL, an infinite faller. And yes, that COBOL, the common business-oriented language that we think of as being old and as being used on mainframe computers. Well, so I'm not exactly using that COBOL, which actually does get continued development and extensive use to this day. But still, I'll be using COBOL on my local machine and not IBM COBOL. I'm using this COBOL, but it has a lot of things in common. And for my art, I'm using work from the amazing Kenny, and I have Ubuntu and JetBrains fonts for the text. So let's look at some COBOL code. Starting with a little hello world here. Well, somewhat complicated hello world. Anyway, COBOL programs are written as programs. They're split into divisions, and underneath that, sometimes we have sections. And we also have paragraphs and sentences that end in periods. But we'll get to the paragraphs later. You can also have subprograms. So here I say, display hello world. Then I call a function written in C, which we'll get to in a minute. And I change the value of my variable num. And then I call this report subprogram multiple times with different argument values. Either a number, which has up to three numerical digits, or my text named variable, which is any three characters, and for which I dumped in some hex data because I wanted to see how GNU COBOL dealt with UTF-8. In my subprogram report, I have a linkage section which can receive my parameters, and I have to repeat here again for some reason at the top of the procedure division. And for string concatenation, you just put them side by side. My C function looks like this. It's just calling printf. Notice it receives an int here, which is interesting because fundamentally, this right here, although it has a numeric picture, is just text. COBOL is primarily designed for calculating business things and then making reports, usually of fixed width format, whether that be binary files or text reports. Let's run this and see what happens. So we get our hello world, we get our value five passed in to the C function, high five. Then we pass in the number down here. Then we pass in the text down here. Now notice I said this right here is numeric. Nine means numeric. Digits, you know, zero through nine. And yet I passed in arbitrary text, in this case, even Unicode data, which apparently GNU COBOL by default just passes through to the system, which interprets it as UTF-8. Though I still saw it as three characters wide, so I guess that's why we got the padding on the output, where I guess the first two went in there, and the third one became a space. Now there's different ways you can control your picture. For example, if I say Z here, then that can left pad my zeros with spaces. Let's see if I did it right. Nope, apparently I needed to have done it up here. Let's try that. Well, that did work for my report program, but apparently it did not know how to convert it properly into an integer for C at this point. I'm still trying to work through some of the details of how GNU COBOL sees these different data types from both a COBOL and a C perspective. Let's change this, for example, to alphanumeric down here and see if anything changes. Well, we still got junk passed through to C, but nothing else changed in this section down here that I changed it from numeric to alphanumeric. Let's take a quick look also, not just at the C that I wrote to help me out, but the compiled C, because GNU COBOL actually compiles to native through C source first. Here we saw this report subprogram being created as some kind of function in C. But we'll notice in the calling here that when it goes to call this function, it doesn't just call it directly. It does some kind of lookup of a symbol. When we get to my game in a minute, I tried compiling my game to Wasm, but it had trouble finding these symbols inside of my COBOL program. And I gave up on it at some point, but the game runs fine as a native executable, even though I couldn't get the Wasm to work. And why it goes through this mechanism, I'm not sure. I have read, but not tried out, that when you're calling subprograms, including external ones, that you can either do static calls with hard-coded string literals, or you have a variable that's a string that represents the subprogram you're going to call. And that's called a dynamic call, if this was a variable instead of a literal constant. But I didn't try that out the other way in GNU COBOL here. And I'm sort of sad that when you give it a literal constant, it doesn't just call directly into that function. Another thing to watch out for here is that by default, your subprograms cannot be called recursively. You have to say you want it recursive. So I could comment this and uncomment that. 
if I had a need to use this recursively. And worth pointing out here that a comet is identified by a star in precisely column 7. Different dialects of COBOL have different ways that you can organize the layout of your program, but the traditional way, and that IBM discusses and GNU COBOL uses by default, is that you have your first six characters being completely ignored. Line numbers could go there, maybe other things. Column seven can be used for indicating comments or sometimes line wraps depending on your dialect or so on. And then columns eight until 72 are where your program happens. And technically, these four columns have special meaning, but I saw no difference in behavior on whether I use them for one thing or another. Anyway, in terms of my program here, notice that I have these things that look like local variables to this main subprogram. And similar things could be happening down here in any other subprogram. When GNU COBOL generates this, it actually generates globals for these things, and apparently different ways of referencing them. You can see my variable names in the comments here that it generates. And so you can imagine that if your locals are actually global, that recursion is not likely to work out very well. And I won't go through it here, but I found that when I said, please make this recursive, it actually, instead of making them local to my function, GNU COBOL generated global still, but also generated a stack that it manually pushed and popped off of. I don't understand all the reasons for everything, just reporting some of what I observed. Let's move on to the game itself. So I cannot claim that anything I did is good COBOL style. I did a little bit of reading of what people consider to be good style. Doesn't mean I did anything right, and it doesn't mean that I read all the possible things out there. My COBOL experience is limited to about the time I spent working on this game. And so in addition to these divisions and sections, down here in your procedure division, which is where all your code happens, you have things called paragraphs. And paragraphs have labels. They're sort of like labels in C, and you can actually use go to with them, but people recommend against go to for obvious reasons. However, you can say perform a paragraph that jumps to that paragraph, executes it, and then goes back to where it came from. And go back ends the entire execution of this program. Now to avoid a single file from getting excessively large, I use something called copybooks, which is sort of like include files in C, but has a little bit of different behavior. We'll see at least one difference there. But it does matter where I copy things in, and some people recommend naming conventions so you know what kind of copybook you have, like whether you know it's a data copybook, for example. I sort of used conventions, but not really all the way. Note also when I'm calling into SDL, which I'm using for my windowing and graphics and input library, I'm most often just calling directly into SDL instead of having any kind of wrapper that I've created around it. I do have one exception, and we'll get to that. So most of my program I made as different paragraphs within my main program. And if there's such a thing as making global variables, I didn't really do that. I just used all of these variables that are supposed to be only for the game program. And I just used them as if they were semi-global throughout most of my code here. And that had its pros and cons, as you can imagine. And one thing to point out here is that abstraction in COBOL isn't really easy to do, though there are ways to do it. They even have object-oriented COBOL since 2002, though I've heard that's not very popular. I've heard from multiple sources that people like to be more concrete most of the time in their COBOL programming, and that's usually a preferred way to think about things. I also made some helper subprograms, which I could have listed on my compile line, but instead I just include them here as if they were part of the main program, so I only have to say my game.cbl when I'm compiling. Plus also my one helper C file. I found that if I did not include some kind of direct calls to the SDL functions, that they wouldn't be available at all. And maybe that's because of that dynamic lookup kind of thing we saw a second ago. I also had various helper functions along the way, some of which I've commented out, including just so I can see pointers of things, because I really wasn't always sure exactly what was going on in my COBOL code. And my one wrapper function that I did to help out with SDL was right here. For some reason, when I tried implementing this function in COBOL itself, my data was getting corrupted. And this function just takes data in memory and loads it up as a texture for SDL fast rendering purposes. And maybe I was just doing something wrong. But this is the one helper function I created for myself in using SDL. And here's an example of one of these data files. I actually have separate ping images for my assets. But I decided I wanted to include them directly as part of the program executable. And there might be a better way to do it than I did, but I wrote a Python script that generates hex data for me. And then I just reference this stuff. And as I mentioned, 
loaded up into an SDL texture. And here in my README, I have some very simple instructions on how I'm building things. There's building running my hello world, and here's building and running my game. First of all, I generate my asset files from my pings. Then I compile the COBOL along with my helper C file, link in SDL, optimize it to be small, and I change the default literal length limit. Normally it's an 8K limit in GNU COBOL, and I had larger files here in terms of my assets. I had some things over 100K, so I put an approximately 200K limit on this here. And then once it's built, I run the game. I end up getting it compiled down to a 243K executable. And again, running it looks like that. I can set time limits or depth limits of how far I want to fall. And then I go. Notice I have some animation side to side that's part of the Kinney sprite sheet. And you just keep going. Keep in mind the formatting here that I used. Again, one of the things you try to do with COBOL is text formatting. And so we'll get to that a little bit later. So here's my sub programs and that util that I mentioned earlier. This is my texture loading that I had been using, which I don't think I'm using anymore when I was loading it from disk after the start of the program. And you are allowed to explicitly request a null terminated string by putting Z in front of the string literal. Sometimes I were to do that, sometimes I didn't. And the reason why this can matter is because COBOL tends to think of things in terms of fixed width for its strings and not about being null terminated. However, I did it null terminated when calling C functions. There's different ways to try to go about that. And in some cases here, maybe I just got lucky. Okay, here's my attempt at loading the texture data where I presumed I might need a very large string perhaps. And this is the function that didn't work in which I instead made in C over here. You can tell that in this particular case, when trying to do a C-friendly kind of thing, the C function was much shorter than my attempted COBOL equivalent. Although worth pointing out here, I do have these attempts at debugging to figure out what on earth I'm doing. Here I have a subprogram for formatting time, including putting that colon in there. Now, I think I ought to have been able to say this was a filler with value colon. And I thought that would work from what I read, but it seemed to be emptying it out to a space. I don't know why that happened. So I made it a variable or a field as they call them. And I put a colon in it. We'll talk about these zero ones and zero fives a little bit later. But notice here that I can get fancier in my formatting. I can say I have nine digits to the left of a decimal point and two digits to the right of a decimal point. And a lot of COBOL work expects decimal calculations, not floating point. So these are fixed as opposed to float. And you can also have a packed decimal format, which stuffs each decimal digit into a nibble or half of a byte, which is going to be somewhat more efficient for storage. And GNU COBOL was also much happier to do math on it than if it wasn't a packed decimal. And note that calling intrinsic functions requires a function keyword. And the most straightforward way to do math calculations and assign the result is something called compute. And we'll see this pattern throughout that we don't necessarily need sentence terminators inside of our procedure division because the keywords control the parsing. We'll get more to this in a second here. Copy with replacing. But here I'm going to draw the stats to the screen. In other words, the time and the distance or depth that my guy has gone. And here I'm doing a lot of copying rectangle data around. Move something to something. That's this equals that in terms of assignment. And you can do string ranges or table slash array ranges. Here I'm at index J for just a size of one though, so it's sort of boring. And I have evaluate when, including ranges on them. We'll discuss this whole idea a little bit more later. Okay, good enough for now. Let's move on. Okay, here I do my event tracking in SDL. I get the start time for each main loop. Then I keep pulling my events and evaluate them. And there technically was a break statement available here to break out of my perform loop. You notice perform is how we call a separate paragraph, but it's also how we do loops. And since I don't really have a break, I perform my poll in advance. And then at the end of each loop iteration, I also perform poll again before I loop back around and see the new state of the events. And these things here that look like Booleans aren't quite. We'll see those soon too. Anyway, here I'm mostly just taking the SDL events and then turning them into my internal representation of what the state of the control is. Okay, let's look a little bit more at the data being worked with here. 
And I said we look at these numbers before long. You have structured hierarchical data in COBOL, but neither the indentation nor any kind of delimiters control what goes inside of what. That's done by these level numbers instead. We're usually started in 01, and if you care about grouping things, and sometimes you can use grouping to your advantage. In some cases, I did grouping here just because it felt like it was more organized. But usually, you'll have a little bit of gap, just like you might have gaps between line numbers and line number-based languages, in case you want to fit something else in between without rewriting all the other stuff. But oftentimes, like 01, 05, that kind of thing's normal. There are certain special level numbers, though, like 88, which is sort of like somewhere between enums and booleans and ranges. And they get sort of interesting because they're a combo of all those features. Here I have a single character, which defaults to space. And whenever it's value Y, that means control down is true. And if it's any other value, control down is false. So this is how I get booleans or enums. There's also level number 78, which I think IBM doesn't recognize, but Microfocus COBOL and GNU COBOL do. And these are compile time constants, which you can then use anywhere a constant might be expected inside of your program. And here's an example of a little bit more of an enum, where I have the mode of our open menu, or our play mode, or you finished up your time limit or depth limit. In other words, you finished your race, so to speak, with different characters for different modes. These could have been more than one character as well, but then I have to worry about what fixed width means. I didn't want to deal with that. And worth pointing out here is that you have to be very careful with your memory. In terms of fixed width, for example, you pass it too few of things. Maybe it'll get padded. In some cases, I got random junk data afterward. And I found things being very poorly type checked. So be very cautious with that here. Anyway, let's look a little more at what we can do with these levels. And worth pointing out, maybe I was just missing it, but I did not find a way to actually define structures in COBOL. Instead, I just define this structured data that happens to be lined up according to the struct defined by SDL. So I chose the data types in GNU COBOL that gave me the right padding and distance and so on, including putting padding here explicitly. And I managed to get it lined up correctly with the original SDL struct definition for the keyboard event. It's a little bit tricky to get right. And also in terms of structures I might want to reuse, I wanted to have a number of different rectangles. So I defined a single SDL rect copy book in which I could replace the name to have different copies of it to have multiple different rectangles around. Whether this was the right way to do things or not, I don't know, but it's what I found that worked for me. So for example, down here, I want my ground tile to have a source location from the original sprite sheet. So for example, which one of these tiles is it grabbing? And I need a destination rectangle for it as well. So whatever said SDL originally over here, I'm replacing with ground dest. So ground dist rect h, for example, instead of SDL rect h. So I get a lot of copies of that rectangle with different names. That's what I found that worked for me. And one more thing to look at here that's sort of interesting, another way I use this 88 was to keep track of the state of the character, the robot running around. I have value negative two to mean use falling, negative one to mean you just landed, and then zero through wherever to mean which frame of walking you're on. And so I can say, am I in fall mode or am I in land mode? Am I in walk mode? If I'm in walk mode, treat it as a number, binary as opposed to decimal. So treat it as a binary integer of saying which walking tile index am I on? So there's my falling mode. There's my landing mode. And here's my walking frames. And so taking a look at that, we have down here choose player tile. If I'm falling, then I have a different source rectangle. If I'm landing, I have a different source rectangle. If I'm walking, it depends on which exact frame I'm on. So some quick takeaways. One is that I could make it work and keep it relatively clean looking code, despite the fact I'm abusively using semi-global variables everywhere. But two, and along with that, I really like the lightweight feel of these paragraph semi-subroutine thingies that I was using. These semi-global variables might be abusive, but it sort of made me wish that I could have lightweight looking things in some other languages. I'm not sure the best way to achieve that while still making sure that we're dealing with proper functional style. Because COBOL is super imperative in its normal way of doing things.
And I found that even though I could make those subprograms like this, there was just so much overhead to it, I didn't want to. Though I do have to say, I really like having hyphens in my variable names. And it's sort of nice not having to use commas anywhere. And they recommended against just using spaces in some of the help text I read. But it was just nice to get away with not having to use commas everywhere. Probably depends on the context whether it's clear enough or not. I can add commas, and as far as I can tell, commas and even semicolons are all just treated as white space. And they're there for whatever conventions you use to help organize your program better. I'm going to turn that again, make sure that still worked. Yep, no big deal. As many commas and semicolons as I want to have. Anyway, so that's a quick tour of COBOL and a little bit of how you might ought to use it and a little bit of how I have used using it. And in terms of the game, I wish I had it playable for you on a web page with Wasm, for example. And if any of you are interested, I'm perfectly willing to take help on getting that Wasm to work if anybody thinks it's a great idea. And I'll link to my project in the description like I always do. But I will give a warning that at some point I was focused just on getting this done and less on the quality of the code or the project structure. So I don't promise excitement if you want to take a look at that. Now, overall from this experience, would I recommend COBOL for a video game? No, I wouldn't. But it was also not as bad as I might have been afraid of. And this is not the first game that's been made in COBOL. You can find some other examples out there. This is just my experience. Anyway, if you liked the video, be sure to subscribe. Bye, y'all.